Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Everybody is having a great day. Me, I'm battling to keep my voice. Uh, struggling, struggling with a uh, uh, back end of a sinus infection. I'm doing pretty good, but I uh, decided not to go live. I wanted to go live. I love the energy. I love the exchange, but I don't know how far I can get. This way, I can take breaks and uh, and put everything together in the editing uh, back back end of uh, post-production and get it to you and none the weary but uh, so there's a lot to update I know that when I talked to you uh, yesterday while I was addressing uh, the dumbass statement that um, Jason Whitlock made about single mothers and how it pertains or some kind of way associated with the beating death of Tyree Nichols. Um, I, I mentioned to you that I had information uh, that was going to shed new light on it, and I didn't want to speak on it till I could get more verification. Uh, I'm still waiting on an ironclad, but it's coming from so many different places that I trust I'm going to talk about it because it's part of an update that I've done on the site and I'm go going to leave the link of this update it's in writing it's in video it's a timeline of everything um, it's a video of me I, I, I'm not doing the I didn't watch it I'm not going to watch it but I gave you everything you need to get an understanding of what's going on you take it as far as you want to take it me personally i'm advising everybody not to watch it if you haven't already watched it if you have uh find a way to decompress and detox uh that stuff is lethal over time and we just get a constant dose of trauma porn uh watching our our, our, our people being slaughtered uh, looking at so much devastation and in many instances sometimes experiencing it ourselves so that's me uh, but I want to talk about a number of different things the first thing I want to do is I want to answer a question that is has been constantly posed to me and I've seen a lot of conversations uh, surrounding it on social media so I want to deal with that first and that is uh, can we still refer to this as racism and I will take you back to something I said yesterday, something that I've always shared. Uh, the reason that I got into psychology was Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Uh, came up from school one, one uh, day in 1985, and she was on the Phil Donahue show defending her Cress theory of color confrontation. Uh, on the heels of the argument of black inferiority, there was this black woman taking on a panel of white men and giving them the business. At that time, I had two professions that I was considering. One was an attorney, the other was a psychologist. And as you see, here I sit. One of Dr. Welsing's uh, mentors was a guy by the name of Neely Fuller Jr. Uh, and one of the things that he always said was that until you understand white supremacy racism uh, he would always say it back, back backwards racism white supremacy 
and how it impacts you and everything and its movements and everything. Everything you think you understand about it, about racism, will only confuse you. And the notion that most people have about racism is that it's an act of hatred. Uh, that what, the, what, what they consider to be racism is more along the lines of bigotry. People who literally hate you because you're black. A system of racism is just that. It's a system. It's institutionalized. It's written, it's written in the culture. It's written in the policy. It's written in the politics. It's even written in the religion. And it is a governed behavior that does not require emotion to be executed. It simply is a part of the process. So then when we look at the system that has given... Uh, qualified immunity to police officers and that qualified immunity is almost always uh, accessed and used in the killing or assault of black males uh, and sometimes black females and, and in rare and rare and I'm not gonna say rare in other cases uh, brown people but we are focused here on us and it's used and this system of qualified immunity wasn't necessarily meant to protect five black officers killing a black man it was meant to give immunity to white officers who are executing policies of policing communities that they should be protecting and should be providing services in they are policing and harassing and arresting at a record rate young black to middle-aged black people in alarming numbers um, there's a reason statistically that there are uh, more black men in prison uh, than there are white men even though more white men commit crimes uh, there are statistics that tell me that a white man is three times more likely, if I'm not mistaken, two and a half to three times more likely uh, to be carrying drugs than a black man. That's statistically speaking. These are what the numbers bear out. This isn't how I feel. This is what the numbers say. The statistics also say that police officers are more likely to be killed by white men. In fact, 71% of uh, officer uh, killings are carried out by white males uh, but who do they fear who are they always constantly afraid of their lives of and even when we're unarmed it's the black man and there is a system behind that this entire system is fixed and fixed and so if I'm, I'm judging it from the true sense, first of all, in the definition of racism, racism isn't about bigotry. It isn't about hatred. It's about a caste system designed to protect one group and provide privilege of that group over another group. It is a system in which one group based on race benefits while another group is held at bay or worse. And that's racism it's the caste system that is anchored in institution institutions in, in academia institutions in politics institutions in the criminal justice system institutions in corporate america and industry and you find it in the very fabric of our nation it is written in the code of the DNA of this country. And so it's not about who carries it out. It's about who represents the person. Who does the person that carried it out represent? When you, anybody represents the police department, they represent a racist system. So are they, if, go back to slavery. We're gonna pretend that there weren't black slave catchers. We're gonna pretend that there weren't black uh, overseers. We're not gonna pretend in, 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 in some places that there weren't even black owners. They are part of the system. They're practicing the system. It happens to be a system that's given a name that is reflective of the dominant uh, group within the system, but it, it is not, lim the behaviors and the practices of this system isn't limited to uh, the people who designed it, anybody who furthers it, Jason Whitlock, 
Stephen A. Smith, anybody who gets behind it and pushes a narrative that supports those who are empowered in the system and maligns those who are not benefited by the system is a part of the racist system. It, 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 uh, there's an old saying that all skin folk ain't kin folk. Franz Fanon told us this back in the late 50s, early 60s, when he wrote Black Skin, White Mask. You got to be understood. You got to understand that there's some people that are so colonized in their mindset that are so bent toward being accepted and being a part of this system that they will cut the throats of the people that they should be defending. And this is a common practice of those we see in high places. What used to be referred to as the black bourgeoisie, we have to be very careful about black people with money and position and a taste of wealth. They will do almost anything anything to protect it. They will do almost anything uh, to advance it. And while there is not necessarily a great deal of wealth being earned in the police department, there is a great deal of perceived power being shared. And so to have that, I'll do anything. But we're gonna get to something and find out that this is something that while sanctioned by a white racial caste system uh, and qualified immunity. It's one of the most simplest emotional failings known to mankind and it's something that we need to grasp a hold of and, and correct within our community. And I'm gonna get to that in a minute. But that's the first thing I wanted to. The next thing I wanna do is real quickly bring up the fact that the fire department in Memphis fired uh, three, MT, three uh, MT, EMTs are fire fire department personnel who were on the scene uh and didn't properly or effectively render aid uh to mr nichols uh one black female one black male one white male uh all of this stuff is in the link you can go check it out and get a play-by-play -play of how this thing is played out and where we are currently in the process of prosecuting and bring everybody uh, to the point of being accountable for the role they played. Remember, there's a white sheriff's deputy in this who never makes it to the second scene where the real true beat down goes, but he's heard saying, I hope they stump him. Well, he has not yet been charged because he wasn't on the scene where the damage was done. Uh, but he may very well suffer disciplinary action and there are charges pending. What I want to talk about before I get to uh, the last of these things is that we are going to have to do a better job of developing ourselves. I'm real big on this. This is one of the things that I fight for. This is why I'm constantly challenging people to support the work I do. It's because the emotional immaturity, the lack of emotional intelligence, the lack of the ability to manage one's emotions is very likely the cause of this young man's death. This man, this young man has left a young child behind has left a grieving mother behind, a grieving brother behind and other family members and friends who loved him because of an inability to control emotions of what we're about to get into. We love to talk about the cancer of racism and I have already given you plenty of reasons to understand why this is still an act of racism, even though at the end of the day, it didn't boil down to being generated or triggered by race. It was facilitated by race the, the 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 confidence that I can carry out this assault and not be held accountable came from a racist system. So without the racist protection, do we have this situation? Maybe we do because we're harming each other in the community and we can't overlook that. But we can't be gaslighted by it either. We can't be told, well, you guys are hurting each other. What the hell are you worried about? No, we, we're not going to play that game. So we're going to sit up and we're going to deal with ourselves. That's one of the reasons why it's so important that we do socialize young black males because their chance of committing violence against one another or themselves is 
significantly dis diminished when they are properly socialized. And there's no other way around it. We need to be socializing young black males into strong manhood. And that's not happening on a consistent basis, especially in areas and communities where there's a dissipated presence of the black male. And when you talk about 1.5 black men, 1.5 million black men missing and 1.3 of those being in prison, locked away, where's the modeling of manhood coming from? Where where is the standard of manhood being set? And instead of being at each other's throats about who's at fault for what, we should be looking at how we are going to plug the holes of the trauma and the damage that has been done by years and years and years of re-injury. We come out of slavery, we never get a chance to heal because we are immediately thrust into reconstruction, 12 years of horror. And then we are, from that point, immersed in codes, the black codes and policies and, and legal statutes like convict leasing uh, and the fragrance, uh, the vagrancy acts that allowed us to be arrested uh, on felony charges of vagrancy and kept in prison up to 12 years and released back out into the very plantations we were uh, free from and we are not even 25 years out of our bondage and we are experiencing all of these things and we go through all of the cascading different impen uh, uh, impediments and infringements and encroachments upon our freedoms over time and we never have had a break where we are in a situation an environment where we can sit back and we can heal and breathe it has never been that it's been one form of slavery after another we have just not in the shackles anymore we're not on the physical plantations anymore but we are being mishandled misled and we are not in a position to move and act because we are not developing the next generation to do so we're sitting up and we're recycling the trauma and we're sending broken children out to become broken men and women and expecting them to perform a task that only the best of the best of the best can do. Now, they have the capacity to be that, but we've got to give them the space to do it. We've got to cover them and insulate them and put them in an environment where they are protected until they are strong enough, until they can resist the suggestions of inferiority, until they can resist the suggestions of not being beautiful and pretty enough and smart enough. We are responsible for what we develop up and we failed to this point we can sit up and we can talk we can gloss it over but when you look at the results they don't lie the wealth gap has widened home ownership i mean the black community is still at 41 percent where it was in 1960 we have not advanced one iota we are still sitting here at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder not because we're dumber not because we don't understand how to operate not because we are incapable but because we refuse to prepare ourselves to go off into a hostile environment and function we're going out thinking that we can convince people based on a standard of of morality that they need to change the way they treat us. We are pretending in our minds because we don't want to subconsciously accept the fact that they don't care because the, the the very nature of who we are is relational so it matters how people feel about us we're the people that that matters to when somebody doesn't like us it bothers us we want to pretend it doesn't but we're built that way and we're going to have to develop tough skin we're going to have to develop an understanding that we are in ourselves good enough for ourselves and nobody else has to like us we have to do that on the individual level and we're going to have to do it on the collective level and we're going to have to do this because if we don't we're going to implode and destroy one another this boils down to this. While the plague of racism is a part of this, this comes down to something really simple. This comes down to jealousy and a lack of emotional maturity, a lack of emotional intelligence. And it, it boils down to this. This is the thing that I was going to tell you yesterday, but I wanted to get a little more information on it. It, it appears that Tyree Nichols was dating the ex of Demetrius, uh, what's his name? Demetrius, God, man, I just had it. Uh, what is his name? And I didn't write it down, but uh, and I'm pretty sure it's somewhere around here. But uh, it's going to come to me. Um, 
is a guy that 50 million places, but one of the officers, um, and I've got so many names flowing through my mind right now, but he was dating, and it seems that he got his boys riled up with him, and they planned to pull this kid over and rough him up. They planned on teaching him a lesson. Uh, the reports are saying that um, they decided to pull him over and beat him up, and it went way further than it should have gone. It shouldn't have never started. You don't get to carry out and execute your personal agendas behind the badge. That's where corruption begins. That's one of the problems we have, not just in what's happening to our young black males, but not being able to trust police officers in the first place. That badge is not a means for you to go out and execute and carry out personal agendas. It is, a, it is something that was supposed to represent honor, but it never has. But let's get back to this thing. So it appears that Tyree is dating or seeing or involved in some kind of way uh, with this guy's ex. Now, you know, can you imagine you being a cop? You got an ex and this new cat comes back into town. He's been living on the West Coast, so he's got a little different, uh, you know, uh, Finesse about him, and he he seems to have a charismatic personality. He's new, he's talking different, and so she's feeling it. And he pushes up on it, and now they're kicking it. And he happens to be anti-police. So your ex is now dating somebody that literally has issue with you, and can regurgitate with with great effectiveness what's wrong with the police department and then in that she's starting to see a lot of the things she saw in you in what he's saying and she's probably spitting it back to you because you know there's nothing like a woman who wants to cut back when she's been cut hell hath no fury and so she's giving you the business and now you talking to these cats and you feel in some kind of way and you get your boys to roll up on it and you beat this kid until he dies because he got your baby mama. Whatever happened to men being able to take an L? She don't want you. She don't want you. And if she don't want you, who she ends up with after that ain't none of your damn business. Outside of the fact that you want to make sure he's trustworthy enough to be around your child. But as far as what she's doing, that's not your business. The thing is, we get so caught up in the idea of possessing something we don't have a right to possess because we haven't been taught how to be men. You don't possess a woman, you experience her. Now, if you really care, and the crazy thing about this, I deal, and I'm talking about it because I deal with it. A crazy thing is, these guys that are killing these women because they broke up with them and, and killing them because they with somebody else ain't killing them because you love them and you miss them. You killing them because they are no longer within your grasp and control. That control you thought you had, you no longer have. And it's eating at you because that's the little piece of power you can get in this world because they're not giving it to you out there. And so you're going to go in and when she no longer wants to be dominated, when she no longer wants to be there, and, I, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that's the case with this guy because she may have cheated on him. I don't know the story, but I can tell you the dynamic as it usually plays out. Now, you want to get upset and kill the next person. And the crazy thing, it just happened here in Houston in a place where I know very well where I grew up. This happened. Cats arguing over a female. One pulls a gun and shoots the other one four times. I have never been one to argue that men shouldn't have the right to emote. I think one of the biggest problems that we have is that we've got several generations of young black boys that were told men don't cry. And so we don't have anywhere to put our emotions. We don't have anywhere to put our feelings. We don't have anywhere to hang our disappointments, our frustrations, our anger. Those moments of feeling uh, 
insignificant and uncertain. We don't have anywhere to hang that. So we keep it all bottled up and we look for little things to hang on that give us a sense of pride, that give us a sense of be, uh, uh, of belonging, giving us a sense of, that, uh, of something that can serve as a substitute for real true confidence. And then all of a sudden it's gone. And we don't know how to handle it because we haven't been trained to manage the emotion. It's not the emotion that's the problem. It's the unbridled emotion that's the problem. It's the inability to check it when you need to check it. It's an inability to bridle it and, and bring it into control and use it to your benefit versus use it for destruction. That's what we should be training our young black boys to do. You have the capacity to be extremely destructive if you decide to be. That's what men are. We are meant to be destructive when we have to in order to be able and capable of protecting the things that we are assigned the responsibility of protecting. But when we have not been properly socialized, trained, programmed, and conditioned to be protectors of our community, we can easily become the destroyers of it. An analogy that I once used is um, is imagine if Superman with his unlimited power wasn't truly aware of his capacity to harm and destroy. What if he didn't know how to manage that strength and control that strength because you got to understand this is someone who can bend steel and stop bullets and lift cars that that, that the strength is un parallel now imagine not knowing your strength you get home from work and you rip the door off the hinges kid runs up to you to hug him and you crush him and wife comes up and to give you a kiss and you literally break her face to kiss her because you don't understand the force you have and the danger inside of this strength that you possess and you don't know how to tone it down and check it when necessary and you become a destructive force in the areas and the spaces you were meant to be protectors. That's what we're seeing in our black men. We're destroying ourselves, we're destroying one another, we're destroying our women, and we're even destroying our kids because we don't know how to check this emotion that's running through us because we were told that it didn't exist. Ain't nothing like being told that black men don't cry, real men don't cry, real men don't feel, and you wake up and you, you, you go through something and you find out that you can get a broken heart like the next person or that you can feel pain like emotional pain like the next person and now this idea that you don't you don't you don't feel that way isn't real and you don't know what to do with it you're embarrassed by it you're shamed by it and so you decide that you're going to do something to prove that that ain't you you're going to prove your hardness by taking something from someone else. In essence, you end up proving your weakness. The greatest strength is the ability to be disciplined, to be controlled, to be calculative, to be thoughtful, to be focused, and to execute with great determination and specificity your responsibilities in your role as a man. That's where strength lies. Not in how quickly you can harm somebody. Now, if it requires harming somebody to defend what you are supposed to defend, you do it with quickness and precision. But it's a last resort. But you will do it without hesitation when necessary. But it is never meant to harm those within the enclave, those within the collective, those within the village, those within the family. We are going to have to develop our young black boys. This is what I consistently push. This is why I'm always asking you guys to support the work I do. 
when I created Black Man Lead, it was really solely at initially off of the research I did on African American adolescent and young adult male violence. I wanted to get behind it and understand it. What I found was there were five primary catalysts behind African American adolescent and young adult male violence. Number five was urban hassle. Urban hassle is all the things that inner city kids deal with that the average kid doesn't. Navigating gang violence to get to school, navigating uh, drug activity to get to school, uh, shots being fired at all times of the night, sirens being run by your, your building or your home all times of the night. Uh, all forms of drug activity. If you're on the East Coast, upper on the Northeast Coast, or you're uh, in the Midwest, L trains running mm. uh, by a house all times of the night, the walls rattling and, and the smell of pollution in the inner city. All of these things are urban hassle and they put you on edge. That's number five. Number four is uh, witnessing violence. When you witness violence, it desensitizes mm. you to violence and it normalizes violence and eventually your norms and standards get thwarted and now violence is acceptable to you. Then there's a higher level of desensitization and agitation and that is being a victim of violence. Not only are you experiencing violence and seeing violence, you're the victim of it. So now you're agitated and desensitized and it makes you more likely to be violent. Now the top two are important. The, the second one is important because it's the hit, hit uh, it's the uh, linchpin on how you can change things, and that's socialization. It, it it turns out that one of the most powerful tools against the proclivity to violence for young black males is proper socialization, proper racial socialization to be in specific. In other words, socialize them into their black manhood, not just black, not just manhood, but black manhood. What it means to be a black man is different than any other man in this world. And it's distinct in, 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 in levels of degree that you can't even imagine. The black man's experience on this planet and in this country is like no other. And so you need to prepare that young black male to be able to navigate this unique experience in a positive and forceful and productive way. You need to let them know what they can do, what they can't do, what they have to do, and what they're responsible for. You need to give them a sense of pride in fulfilling their responsibility. They should be looking forward to being a man so they can execute their manhood. That's socialization, the number one cause. The feeling of being disrespected. Nothing drives a man to violence more than the feeling to be disrespected. And the average person won't understand it. And it's definitely not a justification, but it's something you need to understand. Because at the core of it, if I go to prison and I start to poll everybody in there for a crime of violence, 90 plus percent are going to say in some form or another they were disrespected. Whether they were actually disrespected or not doesn't matter. You know why? Perception is what? Reality. If I believe it's happening to me, it's happening. It doesn't have to be factual. It just has to be what I believe. It's a bunch of people dead because somebody believed something that wasn't true. But when I did that, that was the core. I just wanted to get to a way that I could create a program or create some type of resource that will help mitigate black male violence. I learned a lot more. I learned that when I, you properly socialize them, not only are they less violent, they're more apt to be productive in society. They, they will have a tendency to earn higher wages. They will have a tendency to hold their families together longer. They would be better husbands, better fathers. It's amazing what happens when you properly socialize a child. Here's the problem that I ran into. One of the reasons that we're having a problem with socialization in the first place, two, is that two. The first one is we have 1.5 million men missing. And when you look at the level of, I mean, what, what percentage we make up in the population and numbers, that 1.5 is huge because that 1.5 out of that 1.3 are in prison. 
We have more black men in prison than we have white men, and white men outnumber us significantly. So we literally have the highest percentage of people in prison, even though we make up a very small portion of the population. It's amazing how that is, and we have to understand there are an entire different dynamic behind that, and I'll get into that some other day. So then what do we do? We got a gap. We got these 1.5 million men missing. They're not there. So there are, are literally communities. I remember when I was living in Dallas, they came and got me and brought me to this community. And this community had a 95% female head of household ratio. 95% of the houses there only had a woman in them. And because it was housing uh, on the city level, Dallas has has a municipal city housing uh, program. Once those boys turned 18, they had to go. So you had a bunch of vagrant 18, 19 year olds wandering around. They didn't have anybody to prepare them for that moment. And those men were in there. I don't know how the other men got in there unless they were single parents. But they the program was crazy. And they brought me in to stabilize it. And uh, a brother of mine who's still up there doing unbelievable work, uh, we connected. He was out of Detroit, but we ended up there doing work together. Uh, brother T.R. Berger, we did some unbelievable work in that community. Um, connected with the Promising Youth Alliance, the Odyssey Project, Black Men Elite. We, we did some unbelievable work there. But you, you, you'll see that the crazy thing is when there's no male presence, and I mean like, you, when I grew up, that was a male presence. The, the men in the community had the biggest presence. You knew who everybody's daddy was. And those dads didn't play. And you watched them model manhood. They got up and went to work. They came home and fixed on cars, cut the yard, took care of stuff. And you watched it and you wanted to be that when you grew up. You didn't even have to hear them say anything, but they talked to you. Come here, boy, let me talk to you. And that wasn't, that wasn't your dad. That's somebody else's dad down the street, around the corner. That's, that, that's the village. We lost it. So now you find a man. And, 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 and then you got to hope when you do find a man in the community that he's doing the right thing. That he's not misguiding the young brothers. Oh, this thing runs deep. We have to understand that blaming one another is not how we're going to come out of this. No. No loving one another and standing together and saying, what can I do to make things better? That's all I've ever done. I want to be a person that's a catalyst for change. That is a means of growth and empowerment for my people and definitely the young folks because that's our future. You have heard me say more than once that in order for us to ever really experience true power and liberation, we're going to need black men who are willing to plant seeds and cultivate those seeds, but they are going to be planting seeds they probably won't live long enough to see come to fruition and harvest. Meaning that the fruits they're planting, these young kids that I'm working with, by the time they're able to actually execute what I'm trying to uh, invest in them and plant in them, I may not be here. And I got to be okay with that. I got to be okay that it may take a generation or two for the things that I'm doing to take root. And I got I got to escape the need for instantaneous gratification to be acknowledged and accepted and patted on the back and, and get all the hoorah. Look what I did. No, I've got to sit up and say, man, I've got to be that father that plants and says, maybe my grandchildren will benefit from it. You know, I, I, I've, I, I put my... Children in a better position than I inherited. But what we're trying to get our race to may be a couple of generations or at least a couple of, uh, 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 of birthing cycles out. It may be your grandkids or your great-grandkids that are able to walk out there and, and, and not be shaken by the white narrative of beauty, the white narrative of classy, the white narrative of professional, the white, all these things that we actually fight each other and try to make each other be. You need to shave, that's unprofessional. You need to take those locks out, that's unprofessional. You need to wear a suit, that hoodie is not professional attire. Everything is about fitting into what they say you should fit into. 
He who has the gold makes the rules. I decided I didn't want to fit in that box, so I went and got the gold. My goal is the knowledge of things at an exceptional level that makes me valuable. So I get invited into boardrooms with my hoodie and my sneakers or my boots on. I got the gold and I want to teach young black men, love young black boys, how to tap into the exceptional and extraordinary strength of their minds so that they understand their value, so they page they pad that this isn't about whether you wear a suit or not if that's what you want to do do it what it's about is you can wear that suit and still not be what you need to be you can wear the it's a bunch of them wearing suits it ain't worth shit they're just white with a suit on and they're getting passes that doesn't work for us so if that's not gonna if it's not gonna give me equal attention i'm gonna go for what i can trust that's me being on my a game I got something I do, and the way I do it, you can't get nobody to do it like me. So, Mr. White Man, if you want me to do it, you're going to pay me, and I'm coming up in here rolling just how I feel. Because putting on a suit don't change what I do. It may make you feel better. may make you feel. The Eurocentric idea is governing the black identity, and that don't mix. We're so busy trying to prove we can be as good as them being them that we forgot to be us. Time out for that. But uh, if you want to get the entire update and it's a, a detailed update on what's going on in this story with Tyree, uh, the link is going to be in the description box. <clears throat> I'm going to encourage you to support the work that we're doing at the Odyssey Project, Black Men Lead, uh, our programs for battered women, our programs for intimate partner violence on both sides, our uh, programs for um, <clears throat> mental health, male and female. Uh, there's so much going on. Our research center, which is the most vital element and component of what we do because it gives us the information and the data to then pass down to our think tanks to come up with solutions and programs and, and ways to make differences in our community. We're not going to get it by begging them to fix our problems. So go to the description box. There are several ways to give. Again, the, although the GoFundMe account is in there, uh, it's not the best route to go because there's a processing fee. I prefer going through the organization's uh, account and have it processed that way or giving via Cash App. All that information is in there, but if you are one who wants to give through GoFundMe, I created it just for you because people who use Go, there's a GoFundMe. It's a, it is now. So what I'm asking is if you believe in the work I do, if you can see the extent of my passion over the last 30 years, if you can look at the 25 books, you can look at the 1,000 academic articles, the 30,000 prose articles, the programs endless that I have not only created but actually implemented. I'm actually hands-on with so many different individuals. I'm constantly having people brought to me. I'm one person, and I have to actually run my businesses that pay me so that I can take care of my family. But I'm study dealing with this because nobody is doing it on a grand level. The warriors we once depended upon, they're aging out. Dr. Clark Anderson is damn near 90. Dr. Naeem Marbar is 70 something. Dr. Jordy Gru's in her 60s now. These are the people I looked up to. Dr. Francis Cress Wilson passed away in her 80s. These the, the people I looked up to, I'm approaching the I'm I'm over the age they were when I started. <laughs> Who go, who's gonna take the mantle? We're not preparing them to do that. We're gonna leave them in a world they don't have a clue up about how it works. On that note, look, I'm gonna get ready to get out of here. Thank you guys again for letting me impede upon your time. I know your time is precious. 
I hope that you see the love and the passion I have for you guys and for my people in general. I hope that you see the importance of supporting the work we do. I hope you see the importance of you becoming involved in your own way in being a difference maker. It is the things that we don't think that matter that matter the most. Everybody has a way that they can give. Everybody has a way that they can change things. Be a part of the solution or you are by default a part of the problem. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an Thank you.